Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 133 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing sexual orientation and gender identity in science fiction, and also announcing the launch of a Kickstarter for Queers Destroy Science Fiction, a special issue of Lightspeed Magazine. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got our producer, John Joseph Adams. He's the editor of Lightspeed and Nightmare Magazines, and also the series editor of Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy. He's also edited many anthologies, including the recent books The End Is Now, Dead Man's Hand, and Help Fund My Robot Army. So, John, welcome back. Good to be here. Then next up, we've got Shannon McGuire, who you may remember from our feature interview back in episode 63. She's the author of the October Day series and the Encrypted series, and she also writes the Newsflash series and the Parasitology series under the name Mira Grant. She's also one of the hosts of the SF Squeecast and will be serving as guest editor for Queers Destroy Science Fiction. So, Shannon, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. And also joining us for the first time is Steve Berman. He's edited dozens of anthologies and sold nearly 100 articles and short stories, many of them dealing with queer speculative fiction. He's also the author of the novel Vintage, A Ghost Story, and the founder of both Lethe Press, a publisher of GLTB speculative fiction, as well as Icarus, the magazine of gay speculative fiction, and he'll be serving as reprint editor for Queers Destroy Science Fiction. So, Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Okay, so why don't we start out with John and have you just tell us a bit about Queers Destroy Science Fiction. What is it, and how did it come about? Sure. Uh, yeah, so Queers Destroy Science Fiction uh, came about as a result of um, the success of our special issue that we did last year for Lightspeed called Women Destroy Science Fiction. So we did a Kickstarter for that, and, uh, you know, listeners of the show may remember we talked about it on the show before, but um, the Kickstarter was very successful, and so... Um, you know, and the, and then the issue itself came out and, and it got all kinds of acclaim and stuff like that. And, you know, we did, um, you know, NPR named it one of the best books of 2014. So that was all cool. But, um, given that we had such success doing, um, that special issue, we thought like, oh, well, let's see what other special issues we might do. Not, not just because it was successful, but because we felt like we were bringing a lot of positive attention to this issue of, you know, women being unrepresented underrepresented in science fiction. And so we thought like, oh, well, there's, you know, there's other groups that we could, uh, you know, sort of turn the reins over to in a similar way. And so, um, you know, our first two thoughts were, you know, either queers, you know, uh, we do something with uh, queer fiction. And so we do like queers destroy science fiction, or we do uh, like people of color destroy science fiction, something like that. And so we were sort of trying to decide between those two. And then um, one of the factors that ultimately um, helped us decide was um, around that time, um, I published my anthology, The End is Nigh, and it had like five, five out of 23 stories, something like that, uh, dealt, uh, with characters that were, you know, were gay or lesbian and that kind of thing. And, and, um, only one of those stories even had any kind of political slant to it at all. The other ones, the characters just happened to be gay. Um, but we got so many complaints, like on Amazon reviews and other things like that, like, just like these readers who are just, you know, couldn't deal with the fact that these characters were gay. It's like, oh, the being them being gay just threw me out of the story, all that kind of thing. And it was just like sort of one of those moments where we're like, oh yeah, this is a constant battle for anybody who writes anything that deals with, uh, you know, gay or lesbian, um, you know, and uh, other other uh, queer uh, type characters. Um, and and there was there was a couple other um, sort of instances online where uh, people were getting uh, this kind of criticism, and so um, it just sort of seemed like, well, now now is the time to do this one, and so we'll do this one next, and um, you know, turn the magazine over to queer creators and let them destroy science fiction this time. Now, John, previously when we mentioned this on the show, we had someone post a comment saying they thought that queer was a derogatory term and we shouldn't be using it. Um, do you just want to address that um, quickly? Uh, sure. I mean, I, I'm sure Stephen Sean could speak to it better than I, uh, as a you know, because I'm a, I'm a straight person, so I don't want to speak for queer people. But um, it's it's one of those terms, as as, as far as I understand it, that uh, has been reclaimed by the community that um, it was being it w it once was being used as a pejorative term. Um, and you know, I, I ran into this um, at uh, at at uh, Christmas uh, when I was visiting my wife's family, and uh, and like her dad hadn't heard that either. So like you know, he he heard us talking about careers of choice science fiction, and he was like surprised because he thought it was a it was a derogatory term. But uh, I, I think uh, just the very notion of the way we're phrasing everything kind of uh, 
is provocative and uh in in a way like i mean even when we were just calling the previous issue women destroyed science fiction some people uh didn't um get what we were going for immediately but i think that sort of um you know uh, in, in like so so essentially they thought we were we were saying the opposite that that women actually were destroying science fiction not that we were asking women to destroy science fiction and so i mean but i mean i think that kind of provocative title can kind of work um and i think most people probably have realized at this point that queer has become a, a term that's accepted and not um derogatory uh, but, you know, go ahead, Sean and Steve, jump in if, if you want to. I mean, I'm, sh I'm sure you guys have more background on it than I do. Well, um, I would say that I have friends that are in their late 50s and 60s, and to them, queer still has a sting to it. But uh, these days, it's viewed as reclaimed. The problem is that there's this huge, wide, spectrum of gender and sexual identity that we're talking about and there's no good one word representation for them uh, so queer is better than a mouthful of letters the language is evolving and uh, it's going to be a while i think before we have a good word that encompasses everybody that doesn't have a history as a slur um, and in this case, I, there are always going to be people that don't like the word. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of it, uh, as a word, but it can be put in positions uh, as it has been here, I think, where it's not being used as a weapon. It's being used as a descriptor. Yeah. And, you know, um, one, one thing that, uh, like, you know, what Steve mentioned, you know, uh, what the alternative is to have like this acronym of jumble of words. And, and so, um, the problem was when we were trying to put the title together, uh, the only real option we would have had in that regard would have been like quilt bag destroys science fiction and like, you know, just, uh, and, and that's, that's an acronym that spells out, you know, all the different types of, uh, or, you know, or at least tries to spell out most of the types of, uh, of different, uh, queerness. Um, and it's, it's just like, it doesn't really quite work as a title, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and it's missing uh, pieces. Yeah, sure, sure. And so all of the acronyms would. And so like, but if you use something like queer, it can, you know, uh, say like look this is this kind of thing we're talking about doesn't necessarily we're not actually saying every single thing in this word but it's trying to the other thing is queer also has a sort of weird connotation to it that lends itself to speculative fiction yes you know? hmm huh that's interesting yeah yeah so i just i just want to emphasize that you know we don't mean to exclude anyone or make anyone feel bad we're just you know doing the best we can with the language and i hope people will uh you know understand that um, okay, but so Shauna, why don't you talk a little bit about how you got involved with this project and what your role is going to be and just sort of what your goals are, that sort of thing? Uh, John emailed and asked if I would do it. <laughs> that is how I got it. I, I, I really never know what to do with the how did you get involved with this project questions because left to my own devices, I pretty much just go to Disneyland and stay there. Uh, <laughs> so I don't really get involved in anything. Things kind of happen to me. Uh, my role is I am the, the guest fiction editor, uh, so I'm going to be selecting original fiction for inclusion in the magazine, while Steve, who I'm very excited to, to get a chance to work with, is our reprint editor, so he's selecting previously printed stories, and I probably just stole a question you were going to ask him, um, but it is important because we are working together. You know, Steve will contact me and go, is there any place that you're missing stuff? that you need to find a story that deals with these themes as I'm looking for reprints. Uh, and that kind of makes it more organic than it would otherwise be as a, a finished product. So right now what I'm doing is, uh, is periodically beating social media with a stick uh, in an effort to get people to submit. People are submitting. I would just like more submissions because I'm a greedy little thing. And uh, I'm reading a lot of slush, which is super fun because I can do that in my pajamas. Um, <laughs> anything I can do in my pajamas is super fun. It's the one bad thing about Disney. I have to put clothes on. Um, and uh, once we have hit the the accepting stage, right now we're kind of in the, this isn't going to work. Maybe you could rewrite. Maybe it's just not for us. Let's save this. Let's see what's coming in stage. Once we hit the accepting stage, I'll be working with folks to to try to tighten up things that need to be improved. Basically doing you know, editorial things. Well, so say if someone's listening to this right now and they want to submit a story to you, how would they go about doing that? The best way to do it would be to go to the uh, Destroy SF landing page. 
yeah, it's just destroysf.com uh, because there is a link for current project that'll take you to the Queers Destroy Science Fiction landing page, and that has the submission instructions without me going, okay, now you want to click here uh, for the next 15 minutes, which would be hmm. very boring for your podcast listeners. Uh, we're looking for science fiction for this issue, and I want to stress that because people get very excited by the idea that they could write for something where they don't have to justify the sexual orientation of their characters. Um, and I, I know that sounds a little odd, but I, like John saying, you know, we got feedback on the anthology that it had been jarring and, and upsetting that characters were gay. I get that feedback on a pretty regular basis. <laughs> you know, why, um, why did this character have to be gay? It didn't add anything to the story. It was distracting. Well, the first time that we saw this character, you didn't say she was a lesbian. So this is a retcon because you're trying to force diversity. And I'm like, well, the first time you met all these other characters who are, are either straight or bisexual and currently in a hetero romantic relationship, uh, they didn't say, P.S., my name's Dave and I like to bang girls. So how come that doesn't come off as a retcon? Um, and, and so people get very excited by the idea that that's not a hoop they'll have to jump through and they fixate on the queer instead of the science fiction, but we need both. It has to be queer science fiction. It has to be science fiction by a queer creator. Um, we're not requiring queer content, although it's nice. We are not looking for anything that would not be in a normal issue of Lightspeed magazine, which means that we are not looking for erotica. You can write science fiction that has romantic or erotic elements. We're not censoring it, but Lightspeed is not an erotica publication. And uh, you really, we're looking for anything right now. If your story is amazing, I'll totally take it. You know, we, uh, we'd like to get as wide a scope of representation as we can. We'd like to have stories from an asexual perspective, a demisexual perspective, a gender fluid perspective. We don't have enough slots in the magazine, even if the Kickstarter is wildly successful and it goes to a double issue, to hit every single letter in the quilt bag acronym, much less every single queer orientation in the world. But we'd like to have more than just the usual here's a story about a gay man. Here's a story about a lesbian. Here's a story about somebody that's got six wives. Everything is awesome. We're done. I would guess that you know uh, that you are uh, up on the trends and you know about the, the demisexuals. So, I am demisexual. Uh, ah, well, there you go. So, uh, <laughs> uh, Yeah, I'm a panromantic demisexual, which means that I am romantically attracted to basically all genders that I have encountered, but I am only sexually attracted to people that I have a very strong emotional relationship with. Most people don't know what the demisexual is. It's, it's, it's one of the newer... Um, terms. Yeah, it's uh, it's not a new identity, but it is a new term, and it's honestly been a godsend. Um, right. Because my, mo my mother would be considered like a heterosexual demi. Uh, yeah. Heteronormative. Heter demisexual. Heteroromantic demisexual is is probably that's what you're looking better. for. Yes. Um, because right. I I always thought I was broken. Um, honestly, I I don't like sex enough to be considered anything other than demi. So I thought I was asexual, but then I would have sexual responses to people. So clearly I was a broken asexual. It's very upsetting to be in a marginalized identity and still feel like you're doing it wrong. I guess the old terms were things like prude and things like that. Mm -hmm. were, I, I got a lot uh, of prude. I got a lot of, did somebody rape you, honey? Is that why you don't work right? Um, right. Sarah, welcome to the wide and wonderful world of anything on the lower sexual interest spectrum, uh, part of the spectrum, which is, is why, you know, part of why I was very excited to be asked to do this uh, is if you take a look at a lot of the responses that have come in uh, from folks when we first announced, you'd, you'd have to go back because it was the first announcement. But you have just a huge number of folks who identify as asexual or demisexual thanking us for acknowledging that they exist, mm -hmm. for spelling out that A is not for ally, that demisexuality is a thing, because biphobia is rampant in our community, but asexual just gets erased. So you get told that your identity doesn't exist, you're just a prude, 
Somebody is going to fuck that right out of you one day. I really hope that y'all don't usually try to maintain a PG-13 rating. <laughs> um, cause I've pretty much wrecked that in the last 30 seconds, but you know, there's, there's a huge amount of your identity doesn't get to exist. That's aimed at the asexual and demisexual community. And so I was very excited to be asked in part because I trust me to actually look for that part of the representation. And I, I love our community, but I don't trust huge parts of it to remember that I exist. I mean, Steve, I want to get you in here a bit more. Why don't you talk about the reprints and sort of what are you trying to do with that to maybe be inclusive of these kinds of things or where are you drawing the fiction from, that sort of thing? Well, um, I, I was utterly flattered that uh, John asked me. And uh, also, I've been looking forward to work with Shona ever since I read her work. And uh, I asked John... Uh, how best I can serve to bring attention to older works. And he recommended that I fill in the gaps uh, between new fiction, because there's a, obviously there's a limited number of stories that uh, we'll be receiving. And so my goal is hopefully to bring attention to the neglected areas. That may be uh, both sexual identity and gender identity, or just simply it may be that we need uh, a good quality transgendered science fiction. Uh, depending on what we need, I'll also know how far back I have to go. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, I'm limited, but also s sort of more focused that the author has to be queer. Uh, a lot of the older stories that dealt with gender identity and sexual orientation were written by straights. Uh, Harlan Ellison did one. Uh, a number of famous writers did these stories. Heinlein. Uh, but they wouldn't be apt for the book. And it's late 20th, really the early 21st century that we're seeing queer authors being bold enough to submit their work to major markets and getting the attention. So it's an interesting challenge. Are there examples, Steve, of, of queer authors or queer stories that were sort of the first wave to kind of make an impression in science fiction? Uh, well, certainly uh, Chip Delaney um, and uh, Pip Tree uh, would be considered the earliest waves of being queer both as author and subject matter, um, Joanna Russ, uh, her work is not as well read these days other than her nonfiction. So there are a number of authors that are well known as queer specific writers, but uh, <laughs> The, the again, they're more towards the late part of the 20th century. There's there wasn't a golden age of queer spec fic like there was a golden age of regular science fiction. Hmm. I mean, so like Shannon, I mean, when you were growing up and um and dealing with feeling different and and things like that. What, what did you think of the science fiction that you were reading? Did you see um, any sort of representation in it? Or like when did you start encountering that sort of thing? Well, sadly, I, I grew up uh, as a cis woman, a uh, cis girl reading science fiction. So I pretty much didn't get to come to the party till the late 80s anyway. Um, in terms of, of representation and all of that, uh, I didn't know that bisexual was even an option until I read ElfQuest. Uh, mm -hmm. That was the first of the there is something wrong with me because I didn't just want to date boys. I wanted to date girls, too. Uh, this was in middle school where 
sex was not on the table. You know, so I had no idea that that was going to be a thing. I was just like, I want to date Bobby and I want to date Sue. And I don't understand why this is also very strange. And everyone is very accepting if I want to be gay, but nobody is willing to talk to me about dating two people. And then I, I read ElfQuest and all the elves banged all the other elves like gongs. <laughs> and um, and that was not a thing. So I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's that's an option. Uh, but I found very little representation in science fiction, uh, where I found it was like Armstead Maupin, um, reading a lot of uh, pulpy detective stories, because there were always lesbians. They they were always getting into trouble, and they usually wound up dead, but you got to have Thank lesbians. Um, and, and so, yeah, representation was, was just not a thing. I, I think the first time I encountered actual people that I could look at and go, I could be them in science fiction wasn't until really it was almost all in comics. Um, and then you, you had a brief period, AC Crispin edited two anthologies, uh, bending the landscape science fiction and bending the landscape fantasy, which were both entirely oh, made up he, of, sorry. Uh, those were Stephen Pago and Nicola oh. Griffith. Well, A.C. Crispin did not edit, um, <laughs> but, but her story, I, she was why I read them, because I loved her Starbridge books. So, see, I am I am a big box of factual inaccuracies most of the time. <laughs> no, no, um, no, it's, that, it's my area. <laughs> no, and thank you. Um, I also read a lot of trashy horror porn. Like, there was this whole series of what they called necromantic erotica. Um <laughs> It started with hot blood and then hotter blood. It was it was all dead things banging other dead things. But because those, they were those were Poppy Z Bright, I think. No, Poppy Z Bright did Killing Me Softly. She did a couple books oh. in that genre, but the right. Hot Blood series was Jeff Gelb and, and somebody else. But anyway, they were already books for perverts because, you know, <laughs> sexy dead stuff. So if you're already a book for perverts, then it's allowed you're allowed to have gay people because, hey, it's not like you can get any less likely to sell in the Peoria Barnes and Noble. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I read those cover to cover so many times a couple of them fell apart, not because yeah. I was particularly turned on by dead things, but <laughs> because I got to exist. Well, I mean, I see if you mentioned this is kind of your area. Do you want to, are there other sort of queer anthologies? Like, what is the history of queer anthologies in the field? There are a number of small anthologies that came out from queer presses. Uh, there was uh, Swords of the Rainbow. Uh, they were published by, I know that two were published by Allison which is a, a small gay press that well, at one point was the largest gay press and is now no longer in existence. Um, and they would reprint Russ and Tiptree and Delaney and as well as some uh, gay authors, uh, novellas mostly. The anthologies that really... Uh, hit the mark were the Bend in the Landscape uh, because they they won awards. They won Lambda Literary Awards. They uh, brought attention to queer special fiction. The problem with them was that most of the authors published in the books uh, identify as heterosexual. So there were only a few queer stories in them. In the, uh, there were some collections too. The, uh, an excellent collection was called Somewhere in the Night, I believe by Jeffrey McMahon. He also did a book called Vampires Anonymous. Um, and that at the time when it was published was uh, a great deal of buzz in the, the gay reading community. Uh, unfortunately, the author disappeared. Um, one of the problems with gay men writing was that they were writing under pseudonyms often because they were hiding their identities from their families. Uh, if they passed away from 
uh, during the plague years of HIV, uh, it's hard to get the rights to reprint their work. Uh, the rights could have been reverted to family that didn't want to be associated with it, or it just we don't know who their their real names are. So there are a number of older gay and lesbian science fiction works uh, that are no longer in print. I know that the first gay short story I ever read was when I was 18, and it was Clive Barker's In the Hills, the Cities. Oh, that's a great story. Uh, which is, and and I, I had no idea that Clive Barker was gay. Um, I don't even think that he had come out at that point. And I just so struck me, here are two characters that are gay, and their sexuality is completely incidental to the story. And I remember I was in college, freshman year, and I was so excited about this story because it was just so powerful that I handed it off to uh, one of my dorm mates and his immediate reaction was, wait, wait, these are gay people. And, and he couldn't read the story because of that. But uh, it it showed me that there were gay people in mm-hmm. in horror. So. Um, and, and Steve, you mentioned the Lambda Award. Do you want to say a bit more about that and, and other um, awards in this area? Sure. Uh, the Lambda Literary Awards uh, were started by the Lambda Literary Foundation. I believe they're in their 26th or 27th year. Uh, and they have varied in categories, but they're an award to showcase uh, quality queer fiction. Uh, they have categories for transgender, bisexual, fiction and nonfiction, best anthology, and there is a LGBT uh, fantasy science fiction and horror. Uh, and that's um, one of the uh, more notable queer awards. There's also uh, the Golden Crown Literary Awards, which are only lesbian, but they also have a speculative fiction category. And for a brief time, uh, there was something called the Galactic Spectrum Awards, which were fandom-based, held at a convention aimed for queer fans called Galaxicon. Um, They're pretty much on hiatus. as uh, part of the the good things about these days is uh, gay fans no longer just need a convention for themselves. Uh, conventions like Aresia have a tremendous transgender um, population or percentage of the audience uh, and we're also welcome at Pretty much, ReaderCon has uh, panels on queer identity and things like that. So um, I think that it used to be if you were gay, you would only feel comfortable at Gay Lexicon. But now you are welcome in a wider variety of conferences and conventions. Uh, that's really interesting. I mean, Sean, could, could you give your perspective on that? When when you entered the science fiction community, did you find it a welcoming place or just yeah, what was your experience with that? Well, I entered the science fiction community in the San Francisco Bay Area. Mm-hmm. So I think if any place was a welcoming place, it's where I was. Um, also, I entered the science fiction community as a hyper organized type a teenage girl who sometimes made out with her girlfriend in the hallway and um i'm trying not to make this sound as horrible as it sounds but quite frankly there are people who 
hated gay people who had no problem with me um, because there is a huge tendency in our culture right now to sexualize uh, perceived lesbian activity as being a spectator sport for straight men. So the dudes that might have given me a hard time were really way too happy about the part where a 16 year old was letting another 16 year old touch her boobs. Um, and I, I am aware of how awful that sounds. I, but it's, it was actually my experience was just, I came in looking like a parody. And, uh, as a consequence, I did not take some of the flack that I might otherwise have been entitled to. Um, Entitled is a bad word. I just was, uh, you know what I mean. Subject uh, to, maybe. Subject to, yeah, that's that's probably a better word. Uh, expecting is is also another word because, mm -hmm. you know, I did, I had come out of uh, high school where people were much less okay about these things and uh, proceeded into, into fandom, which was at least trying not to be full of bullying assholes that being another thing you know bullying assholes we don't have we didn't have quite as many um at the time but eh, behold my incredibly awkward answer <laughs> on the whole i did not have a hard time with fandom what i had a hard time with was the same thing that i had a hard time with as a female um was the you get to exist but don't ever tell us about it uh, the only place that I saw it being acceptable or okay to have gay content or bisexual content or homoerotic, you know, homoromantic context, rather, was if it was explicitly erotica. The only time I got to be anything other than straight was when all I was was something other than straight. You know, it's interesting, and Shauna has mentioned to me that during the first few weeks of the open call, she was getting a lot of erotica. And, Huge and amounts of erotica. It, but it doesn't surprise me because, for one thing, a lot of people, uh, to their mind, the only way to identify someone who is not heterosexual would be if they're in bed with someone because. Uh, this goes back to the whole Star Trek and, and Roddenberry saying, oh, yes, there are gay people aboard the Enterprise. You, you just you wouldn't know if you looked at them type thing. And um, so the, one of the ways that people of different orientations felt empowered or visible was by describing, you know, graphic scenes. You you can't have uh, gaydar uh, as a reader uh, unless you're really uh, anticipating certain things. I mean, uh, uh, there's reader a reader expectation. When I read a story, I will assume that the character is m male, white, gay, and Jewish, like I am, <laughs> until I can check off different identities, cultural, ethnicities, etc. And so uh, a lot of people will make it very obvious, and the most obvious way to identify someone is queer is to show them making out or et cetera. I mean, Steve, that actually reminds me of a listener comment I wanted to get to. So Dave Rhodes says, I would also like to hear of ways that authors have managed to include more subtle LGBTQ references in both successful, parentheses, Dumbledore, and unsuccessful ways, parentheses, like Robert Jordan's infamous Pillow Sisters. Uh, I don't know if has anyone. <laughs> okay, I, uh, I actually want to back that up. I do not consider Dumbledore to be successful representation. Neither do I. If, neither if do you I. have to tell me after the fact that you mm. should get credit for having gay content because this character whose romantic life was never, ever, ever, never, ever, ever once mentioned, 
really liked the same gender. No, you you failed. I love J.K. Rowling. I love Harry Potter. She does not get credit for that any more than she gets credit for, you know, having had Jewish inclusion because she recently mentioned that there was one Jewish one Jewish <laughs> wizard at Hogwarts. You know what? No. <laughs> Show me the Jewish wizard at Hogwarts having serious philosophical issues with can I cast spells on the Sabbath? You know, <laughs> show, true. show true. me the kitchen dealing with the ramifications of preparing kosher food when you can't bring a rabbi in, but everybody yeah. else is getting meat. You know, I, I it does not work. Dumbledore is not successful representation. Um, <laughs> so, and it is uh, he, me- I would say, you know, if you want, go to Cassandra Clare. You know, she has her bisexual mage. He's also Asian. And she has a Jewish vampire who, uh, reciting the Shema, burns his lips. I mean, that is, (laughs) she is far better at representation in YA than J.K. Rowling. You know, uh, or take a look at Sarah Reese Brennan. Um, oh yeah, yeah, has amazingly good representation. Uh, she actually just wrote a a complete novel length story that she gave away for free because she wanted her fans to be happy and because she is sometimes too nice for her own good. Um, it's called The Turn of the Story, and uh, the main character Elliot is bisexual, and over the course of the story, dates both girls and boys, and is not presented as wrong or a slut, or gonna settle down and find what he really likes. No, what what he really likes is the people that he likes, and he does not care um, what they're working with. So the representation is there, but but you don't get credit for Dumbledore. That is that is not even doing the bare <laughs> minimum. No. I, I guess if, you, if you're asking for things like coding and how to do it, um, you know, part of the reason why we're doing the special issue is so that we don't have to code, um, that you don't have to worry about gay characters passing as straight. Um, I remember that one of my favorite fantasy series growing up was the Rose of the Prophet series that was by Weiss and Hickman. It was a Arabian night style and there was a gay character in the uh, trilogy but I always was unsatisfied because he had to remain chaste and celibate and alone uh, unrequited love and for years I just sort of accepted that and then I realized that Hickman is a Mormon, and so this was a case of love the sinner, hate the sin. And so he was okay with presenting a gay character, but the character could not have a a homosexual relationship. I I mean, John, I want to get John in here. Uh, As an editor, you read a lot of this sort of fiction, right? Do you um, have any... Uh, examples that stand out for you that's particularly good that you want to let people know about? Oh, sure. I mean, um, Sam J. Miller just sold me a story for Lightspeed um, called We Are the Cloud. We ran it back in uh, September, I think. Um, that's a that's a really great uh, queer story, you know. But you know, he's a he's a queer author, and the story is explicitly about uh, you know queer relationship, and it's just like really well done. And um, uh, I I just love the story to death, and and I can't I can't really recommend it enough. Um, and I mean, so that would be one example that comes to mind. Um, but actually, uh, one thing that I'm hoping that we get to do on the Kickstarter or, or as a result of the Kickstarter is that we have a couple stretch goals. And one of the stretch goals is that actually I would publish, um, what we're calling the, the JJA super gay sampler, um, <laughs> uh, which is just going to be like a, basically a, a mini anthology of, um, stories that I've previously published that have queer that that are queer stories. Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll pull them from all the different things that, you know, from Lightspeed, from Nightmare, from the anthologies I've done. 
Um, and then like our final stretch goal is actually like, so if we reach 50,000, um, on the Kickstarter, um, I'll actually just do that super gay anthology, but we'll do it as a whole, a full size anthology. So, um, and it's going to be exclusively offered to the backers of the Kickstarter. So, you know, you won't be able to get it anywhere else, but, um, through the Kickstarter. Uh, but I'm just, I'm really hoping I get to do that just because it's like, that's the sort of thing that like, as a straight man, like I don't really have any business editing a gay anthology. You know, um, because if someone's going to do it, it should be a, a gay creator or a queer creator uh, doing such a thing. But like in this case, since it's like, you know, Lightspeed's my magazine and I'm doing this um, Kickstarter campaign as a way to support that Kickstarter campaign. And, you know, the Queers Destroy Science Fiction issue, I feel like, you know, like it's OK. And like we sort of get a pass on, you know, whether or not I have any right to be doing it. But um, especially since all of the creators or, or all of the stories are going to be about, you know, gay characters. So um, yeah, there there are two things I, I kind of want to point out here. Um, one that we have not explicitly stated so far, but we are not requiring that the stories for this special issue actually have queer content. We're requiring mm -hmm. that they be by queer creators. Right, right. And I don't think we have, we have flat said that. You mm -hmm. know, if, if what you really feel is a story that is a Dumbledore story, yeah, your character would be gay if it came up, but it's a solo surveyor dealing with a first contact and they don't really have time to think about their boyfriend back at home. That's OK. We're not going to reject because it doesn't have blatant, visible queer content. We're looking at the quality of the story, but it's the identity of the creator that matters more here. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, John, you, you absolutely have a right to respectfully edit an anthology about gay characters just like you absolutely have a right to buy lots of stories about gay characters mm -hmm. you should have queer creators involved mm -hmm. but i absolutely never want to see us as a community getting to the point where oh sorry shannon you can't be involved with this book because it is the straight white cis male book and only members of that group get to be involved but it's okay because john can't be involved with your demisexuals take on godzilla book you know, we, we need to keep everything open as a community because we're doing this to strengthen our community's understanding mm -hmm. and, and to come together more and say to the kids that are in the position that we're in, you know, hey, you are a part of this. You do exist here. You are welcome here. We are not going to stop at Dumbledore. You know, I, I have edited several years worth of uh, years best gay spec mm -hmm. and lesbian I've co-edited and I've bought a number of stories that you publish mm -hmm. uh, in fact uh, I reprinted uh, Sam Miller's um, his uh, story that won the Shirley yeah. Jackson Award yeah 57 uh, but, Reasons that, for the Slate Quarry Suicides yeah that's a great story so yeah. I mean you uh, in in defense to your statement is <laughs> you you viewed the stories as they're worth as speculative fiction, regardless of their you know the the protagonist's identity. Mm -hmm. You were judging it on that basis. So mm -hmm. it just so happened that these characters were gay. Uh, so sometimes in some stories. Yes, some stories it does matter if a character is queer because you're going to bring up issues of uh, the outsider, uh, family relations, uh, of uh, continuing uh, the line of having children, etc. But uh, in other times, the queer identity is just incidental to the story. Mm -hmm. I mean, John, I've heard you talk about like both in Lightspeed and FNSF, how you would get people saying, oh, why did this character have to be gay? I'm canceling my subscription. You know, I'm just curious, how do you feel about that as an editor? Do you ever respond to those people or just like, like how, how do you just, how do you deal with that as an editor? I, I mean, honestly, I, I just have to kind of ignore it. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's sad, you know, um, on, on the most basic level, it's sad. And, uh, and I, it's very upsetting. And, and I mean, uh, there have been times like actually there was there was at least one review um, for The End is Nigh, which was complaining about the sexuality of the characters. And it was written in such a way like the, the language that the person used was such that I was like, I 
I don't know. Like I know, I know you're not supposed to reply to reviews, but I kind of feel like I could reach this guy. Like if we if we actually just engaged him, I think like we could reach him because like he kind of seemed like he wasn't he wasn't like full on bigot. You know, it's like this was like some sort of gut reaction he was having that he was you know uh, not enjoying the stories because of that. But like there was something about the way he, he put it that I was like, I think if we actually made the right case to them, we could convince him. We, we could we could show him the error of his ways like, and why that's wrong headed thinking. Um, and so, uh, and so ultimately, like, I didn't do it, but, um, uh, some colleagues of mine, uh, like, uh, thought it was worthwhile and so tried to engage him, but, um, I don't think the guy ever replied. But, you know, the thing is, it's like, there's so little chance that you're ever going to, uh, convince anybody, uh, with that kind of thing. Like, if, if what you're doing is presenting them with fiction, and in the, in these stories, you know, you're, you're getting into the hearts and minds of these characters that are queer. And they still aren't convinced that that's worthwhile. Like, the reader isn't convinced that that's worthwhile. You're never going to convince them by just arguing with them. It's like, if, if you show them fiction and they can't be moved by that, they're not going to, you know, like, I can't see how, how just arguing with them is going to change their mind. So to me, like, I don't pay it any mind if somebody's saying that they're going to cancel a subscription or whatever because of that. I'm going to keep publishing what I'm going to publish. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's like kind of like giving in to terrorism or something. It's like you can't like say, oh, OK, well, this person's threatening me, so I should stop doing this thing. You know what I mean? So. And uh, yeah, actually, somebody did recently um, actually say that he was going to cancel. Oh, yeah. Um, somebody threatened to cancel or, or he was going to stop reading everything that I edit and publish uh, if I published any more uh, stories by Daniel Jose Older. Uh, mainly because of his story Dust, uh, ma uh, mainly, well, let's say, I think it was mainly because of his story Dust that I published in Lightspeed, but, um, it, it was also at least partially because <laughs> the guy was upset that, uh, that Daniel was, uh, down on H.P. Lovecraft being the, the, <laughs> the, the model for the World Fantasy Award. So it's like, I don't know, this guy had all sorts of issues with Daniel Jose Older, but, <laughs> um, he, but he did threaten to, to cancel a subscription if I published anything else. And I mean, I don't think Daniel's actually queer, but he's written stories that are, um, you know, have queer content. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, I mean, my, my, my short answer is that I, I typically ignore that stuff, uh, even though I, I find it sad and, uh, uh, wish, wish it was not the case. Well, I mean, there are some fairly high profile authors in the field who make inflammatory anti-gay statements mm -hmm. on a fairly regular basis. Uh, I mean, Seanan and, and Steve, how do you feel about that? Or how do you respond to that? Or, what should our response be to that sort of thing? I generally try not to engage just because it's, it's an unwinnable fight. But what is very interesting to me, um, speaking as, as both a queer person and as a woman, is you get a lot of the same rhetoric used to shut down any attempt to talk back that you get when you're talking about feminism, which is, well, if you would just see my point of view and acknowledge that my views have equal weight to your views, then maybe we could reach some kind, you know, maybe we could understand each other. When your view is that I am subhuman and do not have the right to have a happy life that does not cause you any harm whatsoever, your view actually does not get equal weight with mine. You know, it is, it is horrifying to me that we still do have a, a culture and a community um, whether we mean to or not, where somebody can say, oh, no, you know, as as one person in our genre said uh, last year in a comment thread, oh, no, we just need to fuck it out of them about uh, lesbians and bisexual women. Mm -hmm. And it, it was flat out in those words. They just need to have it fucked out of them. Well, no, actually, that that does not work, <laughs> as it turns out. Um, but it does make me very uncomfortable when I'm then told that I should privilege their views mm -hmm. on a level with the views of people that, that don't, you know, call me and, and my friends and family uh, trash people. I generally am opposed to the idea of withholding sales from an author uh, because I don't like their politics. There are people whose politics I strongly dislike, whose work I love and uh, who I continue supporting. But Orson Scott Card has flat out said that the money he gets from book sales goes to things like fighting against gay marriage. Well, my baby sister married her wife during the brief window uh, when gay marriage was initially legal in California. And 
the thought of giving money to a man who will then turn around and use that same money to try to destroy my sister's marriage is revolting. It's not a statement about his politics. It's a statement about he has said he will use the money I give him to directly cause me harm. I don't feel like I should be judged for not doing that. Now, if people choose not to give me money because I'm going to cause them harm by taking my girlfriend to see Cabaret for Valentine's Day, um, that's their call. They get to make it, same as I get to make mine. But I'm pretty sure of the two of us, I'm the one that's in the right. Uh, Steve, did you want to jump in here too? Well, well uh, certainly I agree uh, with everything that Shana just said. You're uh, taking my girlfriend you know, to you, Cabaret. I, I, I mean, <laughs> it's it's convincing. Uh, you know, well, some writers, it's just like some politicians, some just some people. Uh, there's freedom of speech; they can espouse uh, their views. And they're free with their dollars to buy those authors that are uh, that are homophobic. I, as as a queer publisher, my uh, an editor, my concern actually is sort of slightly the the opposite. I, I know many readers that their point of view of uh, speculative fiction of fantasy is dragons uh, or vampires. And if it doesn't have, I, I, I don't want to read a book that, uh, a gay book that isn't about dragons. I, I don't want to read Hal Duncan. His speculative fiction is, is too out there. It's too surreal. I want my paranormal romance. So I'm often... Uh, fighting for a wider range of uh, of the fantastical, of the strange, and also I'm struggling to get uh, the, the 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 gay community uh, is very insular. For example, that I'm using gay, and I should be using queer sometimes. Uh, bad habit, but. Uh, Traditionally, uh, mixed anthologies do not sell well because it was tough to get gay men to read stories about lesbians and uh, vice versa. And so it, uh, the new generation, uh, the millennials, are more open. They use terms like genderqueer. And uh, they're more open to reading about transgendered individuals, whereas uh, there are, just like there are stodgy white men who don't want to read about women in their science fiction, there are stodgy gay men who don't want to read about lesbians. And so my goal is to show the wealth of storytelling uh, and get the reader to try something new. Okay, there's another um, listener comment I wanted to be sure to get to. So Alina Gleason says, you can't do this episode without discussing Cameron Hurley's The Mirror Empire. You just can't. She goes on to say, in YA, Karen Healy, Melinda Lowe, Laura Lamb, and Corrine Doivis have been doing cool things with queer characters, all in gender identity, Lamb in particular. And she also says that if you venture into TV, here's a great infographic about queer women on television right now. And this is something that's at autostraddle.com. It's called 2015 Queer Lady TV. Uh, I think if you Google that, you should be able to find it. But that does make me think, actually, what sort of, um, I don't know, websites or things online are there, resources, communities, whatever, for um, queer uh, people to, um, I don't know, find out more information about this sort of stuff. Um, I don't know, Steve, do you have any sites like that that you, you can think of? Sure. Um, the The easiest is, the American Library Association has roundtables that deal with different issues, and they have a GLBT roundtable. Uh, and it produces uh, several lists of recommended reads. There's the Rainbow List, which is uh, middle grade and YA queer titles. And there's the Over the Rainbow List, which is adult fiction uh, that has uh, positive 
GLBT portrayals. Uh, there's also the Stonewall Award, uh, also given out by the American Library Association. And the Stonewall has honorees uh, and winners in both adult and YA categories. If you're looking for speculative fiction, again, the Lambda Literary Foundation has the awards. So those are great resources for people that just, uh, I want to find a gay or a queer YA book. Uh, what's some of the new ones? The Rainbow List has them. Okay, great. I mean, Shauna, do you, have, do you want to pick up on anything that we were just talking about there? I mostly hang out on Tumblr, which is exactly as useful a resource as you curate it to be. Um, because Tumblr is not, it's not like going to Wikipedia where you can look a thing up. It's a whole bunch of people's individual blogs uh, feeding through what's called your dash or your dashboard. And if you pick the right blogs to follow, then you'll have lots of really interesting information and things to learn and talk about and share. And if you pick the, I'm not going to say wrong because it's a valid life choice, but if you pick the different hmm. blogs to follow, uh, you'll just have endless graphic sets of Chris Helmsworth's ass. And uh, also valid, completely legit as a life choice, but not going to be quite as edu – well, it's educational in a way. Um, it's a different kind of education. Yeah, that's not educational. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't go looking for most of this stuff online. Uh, I'm – I'm a book girl. I read books. I go to the library when I want to know a thing, but I got through most of my questioning and searching and who am I and what am I and what is this and why am I in this handbasket uh, a long time ago. Um, Tumblr is really the, the best community for folks that are just getting started out near as I can tell, though, because it is largely the younger generation. Um, it's not just millennials. It's it's also Gen X and Gen Y. You know, we, we do still exist out here. Um, but you get fewer of the stodgy people saying, I don't want lesbians in my cornflakes. Well, the lesbians are here. They get cornflakes, too. Um, and so you can kind of have find out what's going on. Um, now, we, we're, we're still a fanish community. We have the internalized misogyny and uh, exciting issues with female characters getting in the way of our exciting slash fic uh, that any other part of fandom does. But at least we're trying. All right, cool. So, uh, John, why don't you tell us a bit more about this Kickstarter and just like how do we support it? Just sell us on this whole thing. Uh, so, yeah, the Kickstarter launched on Thursday, on January 15th. It's going to run until February 16th. And so if you just go to um, actually the easiest uh, URL to give you is just go to destroysf.com slash queers. And that's going to redirect you right to the Kickstarter page. Um, and, uh, we're hoping to raise $5,000, uh, and that's our, our minimum goal at, at $5,000 that allow us to make the issue into a double issue. Now we're going to publish this issue either way. So that it's going to be a special issue that we're going to publish in June, regardless of how the Kickstarter does. But if we raise that $5,000, we're going to make our special issue into a special double issue. Okay. And then, um, we have a bunch of stretch goals, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and, uh, so in addition to, the super gay anthology thing that I mentioned. Um, also, our um, our thirty thousand dollar stretch goal is we'll we'll publish an additional special issue called Queers Destroy Horror. Um, that'll be a special issue of Nightmare Magazine. And then if we reach forty, um, we'll do a Queers Destroy Fantasy um, special issue um, as a special issue of Fantasy Magazine. Um, so you know, there's lots of cool stretch goals. Um, also, at thirty five thousand, uh, Seanan will write a song about destroying science fiction. Um, as as uh, fans of hers will know, uh, she's a, a extraordinary filk artist. In addition to being an amazing author, so that'll be that'll be cool. Um, and yeah, so I mean, but I mean, uh, if you guys want to pop over to there, you can see all the different rewards. Um, you know, five dollars gets you a copy of um, the Queers Destroy Science Fiction special issue, along with some extra bonus stuff. Um, and there's you know you can you can get subscriptions, you can buy it in print um, as a trade paperback. Um, all kinds of great rewards. Um, and yeah, uh, yeah. So I mean, that's basically it. Um, uh, uh, I mean, John, is, is there anything that you know for sure, like in terms of authors or uh, articles or anything that you know for sure right now is going to be in the issue? Um, it's still really early in the process, so we don't really have anything. Uh, we don't have anything under contract yet. Um, 
But uh, Catherine M. Valente, Amal El Moltar, and John Chu, who won the Hugo Award uh, last year um, for short fiction, um, uh, they all have uh, said that they're going to write stories for the issue. So uh, assuming they come through, um, well, they'll, they'll have stories in the issue. Um, you know, we can't promise it with 100% certainty, but they did say that they were planning to write stories for us. So, uh, so that's what we have sort of on tap so far. But, you know, um, as Sean was saying, um, submissions are open right now and submissions are going to be open until uh, at least February 15th. Um, and uh, so, you know, we're hoping that, uh, you know, once once this episode airs, that'll boost the signal. Pe- more people are going to find out about it. So maybe hopefully, uh, you know, even more people will will write stories and submit them to the issue. And, uh, you know, uh, one of the fun things about doing um, any issue of a magazine is um, when you're open to submissions to the wide world, is seeing, like, you know, what uh, surprises await you in the slush pile. Because, you know, you're discovering new authors and all that kind of stuff. All right, cool. So, Shauna, do you have any just final thoughts you want to say about Queers Destroy Science Fiction or this topic or just anything you want to mention? You should submit more so that I have an excuse to sit around in my pajamas reading slush. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, I have I have another thought, too, um, also. Uh, actually, one of the neat things that we did uh, with our campaign last year and that we're also doing this year is... Um, we're going to have um, a series of essays on the Kickstarter. So, like, we're going to post a series of project updates that are going to be these personal essays from uh, queer creators uh, of science fiction, either uh, either queer creators or queer readers of, of science fiction and fantasy, and talking about their experiences being a queer person, um, either uh, working in the field or just interacting with the field, you know, as a fan, that kind of thing. And so they're going to be posted throughout um, the 30 days of the campaign um, and then one of the one of the other stretch goals is that if we um, if we reach that stretch goal, we'll include those essays in the issue itself. Um, and I think that turned out really great last year. Um, I really hope we meet that stretch goal because uh, it, in retrospect, it really seemed like it was an integral part of the issue that made it something um, like took it to the next level. Um, because I mean, those essays were really great last year, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what everyone comes up with this year. But um, you know, if you're a straight person wondering what all the fuss is about, you know, I think those essays are really going to do a lot to open your eyes to what, um, you know, what queer creators or, or what queer, just what, what queer people in general have, have had to deal with, um, you know, throughout their lives in terms of representation and being accepted and all, all that kind of thing. So. All right, cool. And uh, Steve, any, any final thoughts? Well, uh, I, I'm hoping that we get a lot of donations because I would really love to see a uh, queers destroy horror and queers destroy fantasy. Uh, it would allow uh, me, as uh, as a consumer of of these genres, to to see what uh, people come up with. Uh, and also, as a reprint, I could uh, bring some old stories back to attention. Uh, but I'm I'm just excited about the whole process because I can't lose. I. You know, I <laughs> I'm the target audience here, and uh, I, I just, I just can't wait to see what people submit. So uh, I'm hoping that people are generous with the donations and allow three issues to to happen. All right, cool. So I think we're going to wrap things up there. So guys, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to John Joseph Adams, Sean McGuire, and Steve Berman for joining us on the show. And once again, to help support Queers Destroy Science Fiction or to submit your own work, visit destroysf.com queers. I'd also like to thank everyone who's given us five stars on iTunes, including James and Jewel, who writes, Intelligent with a dash of fun. I found this podcast recently. My life is no longer incomplete. So big thanks again to James and Jewel for that great review. This episode was also made possible thanks to support from listeners such as Leonid Levchenko, Abigail Drake, and Peter Byrne. So thanks, guys. We really appreciate it. To learn more, visit us at geeksguideshow.com and click on crowdfunding. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit GeeksGuideShow.com. To learn more about your host, visit DavidBarrKirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. 
if you didn't enjoy it. Tell no one. Thank you for listening.